this is a long video. Here are the sections and their timestamps. In a prior video, we showed how to install and harden a minimal Linux on a Raspberry Pi 4. In this video, we show how to set up an SSH honeypot. Section 1, Intro. Years ago, a security team at a university learned that one of their computers was attacking their other computers. The warning came from their honeypot system. As they investigated, they found that their systems had been penetrated by hackers working for the Chinese government. The warning helped them to detect, investigate, and recover from the penetration. Back then, a honeypot was a considerable investment of time and money. In return, that honeypot provided several benefits. It allowed them to detect when a local computer attacked other local computers. The honeypot helped them to know when they had compromised credentials. The honeypot provided real-time intelligence on the nature and intensity of internet attack. The honeypot allowed them to block attackers at their border. And the honeypot helped them to send out abuse notifications to the owners of the attacking systems. Today, almost anybody can set up and maintain a cheap honeypot and gain most of these benefits. This video shows you how to create and maintain an SSH honeypot using a cheap Raspberry Pi and a little bit of code. This is a low interaction honeypot. It does not attempt to mimic an interactive computer. It just detects when attackers target an SSH system. This may not seem like, like much, but it can email you when it sees attack activity from an important subnet. It can email you when it sees the use of an important username. It can email you when it sees the use of an important password. This alone might be enough to help you detect hostile attackers or well-meaning pen testers. Section 2. Install the SSH honeypot. You will need a Raspberry Pi 4, an installed Debian 11 bullseye image on the Pi 4. See the previous video for help with that install. These instructions or you could use the shortened checklist, and you'll also need a program to automate alerts. I put links for the checklist and an alerting program in the video notes. We choose to use a Raspberry Pi 4 because it was cheap and available. We tested an old Pi 1, but it could not keep up with modern multiple attackers. We choose to roll our own honeypot instead of so using something like the SANS D-Shield image because we want to teach people how to do it themselves. We are going to use the Daniel Robertson's SSH honeypot code to create our honeypot. That code is available on GitHub. So we start by installing git on the Pi 4. Next, install packages necessary to build this code. The code needs to be compiled, so we need to install the compiling environment. This will install rather a lot of packages. Uh, when all those packages finish coming down, you're ready to uh, suck down the code. So, as the non-root, uh, non-privileged user grab the source with uh, 
git clone command. That comes on pretty quick, actually. It's a relatively small program. Next, become rootly, uh, grab privileges. and then move to the directory that's got the code and compile and install the software. When this is successful it does several things. It compiles the code, it generates a temporary SSH key for the honeypot, it compiles the binaries, or rather it copies the binaries to the right locations, and it sets up the systemd service unit files so the honeypot is automatically ex uh, executed. After you finish building the code, it generates um, executable files here in this bin directory, but they're owned by root. Uh, let's clean that up a little bit by changing the ownership back to the non-privileged user. That's better. Next, tell the system to automatically run the honeypot service. You can check the status of this service with uh, the systemctl status command. Active running. By default, the honeypot sends its log messages to var log ssh honeypot log. Uh, let's see. And there's one there. Let's see what it looks like. Just the start message. And next, let's see uh, if it's bound to port 22. So let's inspect the system listening ports. And we've got the honeypot running on port 22 and the normal SSH server running on the uh, changed port. Now we can test the SSH honeypot by attempting to log into it. SSH test user at 127.0.0.1 port 22 and there it is with its key. Yes. Okay. Um, you can't actually log into this SSH honeypot even if you use a valid username and password. The honeypot logs every attempt to connect and it collects the supplied usernames and passwords. Let's take another look at that log file. And there's the uh, username and passwords that I tried. Section 3, automate the SSH honeypot. The best honeypots are cheap and reliable and they don't bother you all the time, just when it's important. So we need to automate as much as we can. The honeypot currently appends log entries to a file at uh, slash var slash log slash SSH honeypot this log file will grow in size forever. That can get cumbersome. So we need to do something about old logs. The built-in Linux facility for maintaining log files is called log rotate. Our first automation step is to tell log rotate to handle this log file. We begin by creating a descriptive log rotate file for the honeypot. Then paste in the following lines from the checklist to that file.
This informs log rotate where the base log file is. Log rotate rotates our honeypot logs daily. It keeps about 14 days worth of old log files. It stops the honeypot before log rotation and then restarts it after the changes. Hit Control X to exit Nano and save this uh, configuration file. Next we need to change some permissions and ownership for this configuration file. It's probably okay as it was, but it's best to make sure on things like this. Now we can test the log rotation and make sure that everything works okay. So let's invoke log rotate and point it to that file and see what happens. This should create, uh, this should rotate the log and create a new file. And it hid. There's the um, standard log file with the startup message and the old one with the data that have been accumulated so far. Now we need to set up automated alerts. We want the honeypot to notify us when something important happens. I made an example bash script to generate email alerts. It's crappy bash code, but it works. It's designed to be run at regular intervals, so you can put it in your cron tab. It scans through the most recent log entries. It sends an email if it finds a connection from a monitored IP subnet. It also sends an email if it sees the use of a monitored username or password. As the unprivileged user, let's see, who am I? Yep. Change to the uh, directory with the uh, honeypot and grab the uh, bash script using the command from the checklist. You can always get the latest version of this bash script from this Google Drive location. Once you suck it down, flag it as executable, and give it a look-see. Has lots of comments. It'll tell you what it needs and how to use it. And one of the things it needs is 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 it has a couple of dependencies. So first, you'll need to install a couple more packages: Crepsider and Snail. Crepsider is used to make quick comparisons to see if subnets if an IP address falls within a listed subnet, SNL is basic mail functionality it's used to send out the alerts. After you suck those down, you'll need to create a configuration file for the mail program and uh, put some data into it. So that configuration file goes in your home directory and it's called .mailrc. Then post in paste in the following lines from the checklist and you'll need to modify these last three lines. You'll need to pick a or create a Gmail account that's used for forwarding email and then list it that Gmail account here just the username you'll need to create an app password for that Gmail account. Here's the link for creating Google app passwords, or you can just do a Google search for <laughs> Google app passwords. It'll lead you right to the link. That uh, Those Google app passwords are a long string of characters, and you'll need to put that long string of characters here, and then you list your Gmail account again there. Once you've done that, save this and uh, make some changes to the uh, bash script. So nano parse. You'll need to make um, four changes. First, you'll need to list add your monitored subnets here. I've listed the various private non-routable 
subnets and you'll want to monitor those if you see an attack come from from those you know it's local but you'll want to add your own subnets here you may also want to add the subnets of your business associates and your trusted partners if you see an attack coming from one of those you need to let them know you need to take action once you've added your subnets you'll need to add any username you want to monitor um, these are just some famous fictional hackers but you'll want if you use this functionality you'll want to add your usernames here and here's some famous passwords um, you probably may not want to expose your current passwords here but you certainly might want to put your old passwords here especially old important administrative passwords and then you, this also gives you the opportunity to create breadcrumbs scatter uh, credentials li likely looking credentials around in your databases and various uh, trusted spots and then if they ever end up being used you get a chance to uh, find out about it finally you will want to add the email address that you're going to use to catch the alerts this is the target of the alerts once you've made those changes uh, take a look at the rest of this file see if there's anything else you want to change shouldn't be but you might want to add or change it it's not very good bash code and I'm sure you can do better save the changes and you should be good to go next up do some testing okay let's uh, generate some uh, connections from a trusted monitored uh, subnet and see if it that generates the email alerts the first test just run the script make sure it doesn't give you any errors or anything it just coming back like that's a good thing it means it ran second test SSH to the honeypot from a monitored subnet using maybe a monitored username and uh, make sure it creates uh, the appropriate data in the log file so more slash var log ssh and that showed my latest uh, connection third test is quickly run the bash script again within the alert window for uh, the cron tab normally that alert window would be within 60 seconds and see if it generates email for you all works you see something like this when you check your email a short message that uh, says the honeypot detected uh, activity that matched its alert criteria if you don't get an email then you should enable the email debugging messages using the instructions in the checklist the step is to ensure that the bash script keeps checking you can instruct your pi4 to run this bash script every minute by editing your cron tab file uh, it's located at slash etsy slash cron tab oh, first we'll have to become root leak. and get down to the end of it and add this line from the uh, checkpoint checklist this one instructs it to uh, find that par script and run it as the unprivileged user every minute Once you've done this, make sure it works by generating another uh, test event. And then the parse script should just within a minute automatically run. It looks to see if there's been any new honeypot activity within the alert window then it checks it to see if it matches the alert criteria and if it all comes up right you get an email automatically within an, a minute or two 
Congratulations, you now have a functional SSH honeypot. You may wish to set up copies of this honeypot near networks that need protection. If you choose to use this honeypot at home, you should configure your home router to always give the Pi 4 the same IP address and then you should port forward incoming TCP 22 connections to the honeypot's IP address. The final most important step in having a honeypot is regular maintenance. Maintenance ensures that your protections remain functional. Maintenance only takes a few minutes every week. Regularly, once a week, you should connect to your honeypot and apply updates. You should then reboot the honeypot if there are significant updates. Next, you should check to see if there are important updates to this honeypot project. Finally, every week you should generate a test connection to the uh, test SSH connection to the honeypot service and make sure it sends you an email alert. The honeypot is quite robust. Uh, this one can take a lot of abuse. It doesn't need updates all the time. So if you go on vacation, it is okay to skip a week of maintenance. But don't make it a habit. A honeypot is kind of, kind of like a smoke detector. When you need a smoke detector or when you need a honeypot, you need it lots. Also, be very careful as you handle or store lists of attacker usernames and passwords. They're hostile data. They include code insertion attacks. Set up this honeypot and exposed it to the internet. After uh, several days we had lots and lots of data on attackers. <laughs> Within a day we had this Chinese attacker coming around and offering up lots of interesting passwords. But the neat trick here is mingled in with these interesting passwords are five different code insertion attacks. It appears that some attackers are attempting to exploit honeypots and their back-end honeypot databases. You must always take care when you collect data from attackers there's a good chance some of it is quite hostile. 